It's not well, but it works. Look. Pulls it out. And he goes blowing red. Oh, isn't it? That is so cool. He used to puff smoke out of his ears, but I think it's just going to dry up now. But Elsie Crack was here. Elsie Crack. Oh, my God. It's cool, isn't it? A bit of background, I'd love to know about what got you into motorcycles especially and then maybe what got you into into engineering. Well, my dad said I couldn't have one. That's the classic thing, isn't it? That's oh, what I, I always say. My mates had mopeds when we were at school when we were like 12, like rally runabouts and Honda C50, well Honda C100s. Wisps and... Wisps and, you know, and I wanted a rally wisp actually, it was a wisp. It was a wisp? Rally wisp, my friend had a gold one and he said you can have it for five pounds or something silly. Uh, but my dad said, no, you're not having a motorbike, because apparently he fell off and hurt his knee bad on a Valisette back in the 60s, and he didn't want me to go through the same thing. And yet a Wisp is almost like yeah. just kind of a push bike with a little bit of an engine. Yeah, so I got it anyway. Yeah. Because I said, yeah, bring it around, put it behind the shed. My dad's at work all day, he won't know I've got it. So I had it for about three months before he realised I had it. And by the time he realised I got it, I'd put a lawnmower engine in it, a, 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 <laughs> Bri a Briggs and Stratton, which is like a 200cc side valve engine, hung that underneath with a belt, and it, of course it went twice as fast as the standard Valley Wisp. On the same size wheels? Yeah, this is when I was 12. Same size. We were doing like 35, 40 mile an hour across fields and crashing and having fun. It's no, no worse than a push bike having a crash. So, well, so that's what no, I did. Even though you're going at 35 to 40 miles an hour. Yeah, so that came and went. And then I got an original Honda C100, which is basically a 50cc iron engine Honda. And that was great. I loved that. I learned a lot of riding skills on that. My friend had a Yamaha YL1, which is a 50cc yeah. 50 cylinder, twin cylinder 100. Unbelievably fast. When you're 14, it felt like a rocket. It's, it's, this thing would do 60 easily, you know. So you cut the exhaust off, cut the mud guards off, get rid of all the stuff you don't want. And just, we used to rag around fields. So going back to sort of the lineage of, of your sort of early bikes, uh, what sort of path did you take after kind of going from illegally right. <laughs> annoying people on a was, bald, tired... I was, on, uh, I was on my paper round in 1976, it would have been, I was 15. And in the garden... Was God a... knows what you rode on a paper round. The rest of us probably did it on choppers no, I, in 1976. I, I'll, I'll tell you what I did in 1972, which is I put a set of suspension forks in my push bike. Way before anybody. anyone even considered doing it. No, uh, they're off a Suzuki Bloop. We used to call them the Bloop, the B120P. Yeah. I took the whole front end off that and put it straight onto my push bike, and I had suspension forks. And everyone used to marvel at it, because going across the tracks we used to go on, I had suspension. And I took one spring out, so I only had one spring, so it was actually soft. And, it worked, and that was in 1972. And there was no, no mountain bikes at that time that had no. suspension. But anyway, back to the Malaguti. I, I, in this hedge was a Malaguti Olympic, like lent on its side. It was one year old. And it had been it was one year old Just bike. abandoned. Abandoned. The guy had used it for a year and it was obviously broke. The gearbox was sheared, it seized up. It was one year old. It was M Reg, or N, N registration, 1975. Yeah. And I bought that for 20 pounds, which was six or seven times my pay for round money, basically. I got this bike, it was one year old, and I took the engine out and stripped it and bought all the parts from um, Malagutti UK in Ripley in Surrey. You had to do it by post in those days. Yeah. I had to have a new big end, new piston, new gearbox parts. I think I spent £20 again on all the parts. So for £40, so 40, pounds, 40 quid, you've got a one I got year old a £200 bike. new bike, brand new, and I rode it for about a week and it blew up. And again, self taught. Oh, we had the Reader's Digest book of engines. The I remember Reader's. that. <laughs> and it was a book about that thick. And it was just on engines. Just about the basics and the piston, crankshaft, valves, and etc. So it would give you an idea of how things worked and uh, yeah. what they should do, and then you kind of went from there. Yeah. So I just started work, so I'm doing 40 miles a day on my Malaguti Olympic, and it would do 60 on Monday, 55 on Tuesday, 50 on Wednesday, 40 on Thursday, and seize up on Friday. And that, that was basically. <laughs> you the, knew when the weekend was coming. At least. That was the routine I went through every week, basically, or once a month probably. New pistons. I got fed up with it in the end. My friend had a fizzy. So you know, you know why the original owner threw it in a yeah. Bridge. It's it was, I think it was so fast that it just blew itself up. With we used to put Castrol GTX in the petrol in those days, not high tech synthetic two stroke yeah. or just Castrol GTX from the garage. They'd pump the thing up and down, put three spurts in for a gallon, and that was when the plugs were always whiskering and stuff with a carbon build up. But anyway, my friend had a fizzy, and that used to be so reliable. And I said, that's what I need a fizzy. Of course, they're so expensive in the day. Mm. 
but I found a crashed one with a good engine. So I took that engine out of the fizzy and put it in the Malagutti. And that was an unbelievable bike because I had the Italian handling of a Malagutti. <laughs> but so the, that was all machine, well, you said then I used that special. I used that every day for work for the rest of my 16 year old time on bikes when you had to have your moped. And hey, um, your job, what was your first job? I was a mechanical engineering apprentice with the MOD. So. Oh, and was that something that came out of your passion for metalwork? Yeah, metalwork. I was good at metalwork at school and really enjoyed metalwork. So that was my, all I wanted to do was work a lathe and work in a machine shop. So, so perfect so, first job then? Yeah, so I did that. So I was commuting 40 miles down my homemade FS1 e Malagutti hybrid that worked really, really great. And then when I'm 17, I got a CD175. Because my dad's always said to me, small progression mm. and then ride that bike to its absolute limit so you can't ride it any faster and then get a slightly bigger one so we knew quite a bit considering yeah he was quite he, he never told he never product. told me what to do he always advised me he said it was quite nice for you you know what happens you tell your kids to do something they won't do, do it the, 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 so he said complete opposite. my advice is get that 175 when you can ride that at 80 everywhere he said then get yourself a 250 so that's exactly what i did i in fact i didn't get a 250 i got a 500 I went straight from a CD175 to a brand new CX500A in 1979, which was my first proper... The Maggot? The Maggot. Plastic what Maggot. What do you think about the Maggot and the engine I, layout? I actually love it. They love now, aren't they? But they were kind of derided in, for many years. In its day, people used to laugh on the other side of their face when I used to burn them off. Yeah. They would do a genuine 90, 85, 90, but all day long everywhere. I used to jump bridges. I raced it around Thruxton Motocross Circuit just for a dare one day. I've just for a day, yes. you raced the CX500 around a motocross yeah. circuit. I said to some bloke, I thought I'd be quicker around that track on my road bike than you are on your dirt bike. And he goes, prove it. <laughs> so anyway, I got my CX500 and rode it around the track. <laughs> I, did, I did one lap and came in covered in mud. But I did it. But you were faster. I wouldn't say I was quicker, but I, did, I, 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 did, I got a lap But you in. did it anyway. I did it. just to, With me, um, TT100s it would have been then on the bike. So. What part. actually sometimes inspires you for the, the, the creations that you make? I always like to have something different. Something that someone else hasn't got. Is that why you've gone from a, you know, a always, sort of V10 powered to a V-twin? To yeah, because I, 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 I'm not a, like a Kawasaki person or something, or a Yamaha person, or a two-stroke, or a Japanese, or British. I like all motorcycles from all, from everywhere, basically, even scooters. I had loads of Lambrettas when I was before riding age. I used to find them in hedges, TV 175s, LI125s. Even an SX220 I found once. Again, would people just leave, you know, they just, just stop they working were, and they just... They'll be on the paper round and they'd lean against a fence. And I thought, that's been there for about three weeks. So you knock on the door and they go, yeah, it's, have it, take it away. And it need a piston or a tyre or something and silly. it's too much hassle for them. And yeah, and I used to ride them around. You. And I used to cut all the body panels off and stuff like that and have a laugh on Lambrettas. But now they're valuable artefacts, Lambrettas. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, they're like £7,000 for a, a nice one. One bike I did miss, that I made when I was, that I did miss telling you about, when I was 15 for my metalwork project. My dad had a couple of minis. How cool is that? Oh no, you had a mini engine bike. Yes, because my dad had a couple of minis. Because he, he, was, he used to buy a car and run it into the ground and buy another car and run it into the ground. So in the garden was two minis and one of them was a Cooper. It was a white mini Cooper, 1963. So the engine in that would have been a... It was an 850cc twin carburetor. But anyway, the bodywork had rusted away, so I said to my dad, can I have the engine? And he said, well, what are you doing with it? I said, I'm going to put it in the Bantam. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you were going to put it in the Bantam? I said, well, I'm going to fit it in the Bantam. So I got this BSA Bantam, I sawed it in half, made some brackets up, and welded the brackets onto the front, welded brackets on the back, and got this engine between the two subframes with the wheels and forks so you could push it along. Put a chain on it, and I rode it up, the, up to school across the back roads and through the little lanes. As your Metal my metalwork project. project and took it into school. Is that the one bike that you'd like to have well, maybe kept? Or? Not kept, but I'd like to have a picture of it. it would be, if it's just a little black and white one. Mm. But I, I can remember what it looked like. It looked, probably looked a bit awful, really, but it did work. Yeah, but how old were you? 15. So that set my scenes, really, making like the Viper. Same sort of thing, really. Mm. I, that was always in the back of my mind when I was but making the Viper. It was just a bit crazy, a little bit out there. Yeah. Everyone said you can't be done. Everyone says it'd be horrible, it won't work. So you go to prove. But it worked. Yeah. At the very least. Yeah, the, the mini engine bike worked. And I remember riding it with my friend, Paul, and we were going across some bit of field and we fell off of it and we burnt our legs on the exhaust. And my dad suggested I took it apart. He said, that's dangerous really, isn't it? Let's, let's take it apart. So we did, we took it all apart. Well, my little garage is here. Uh, you did say little garage. Yeah. I'm surprised at just how little it is. Just a single garage. Something that people have said who've been here before, they're surprised that you do so much. I mean, I know you've got other sheds. Well, that's what it says here, look, Honda 6 from the shed. Exactly, but you do so much and can get so much done. Mm. Effectively, you know, 
a motorcycle manufacturer that comes out of something that's probably seven foot well, across. What happens, I've been around so many people's houses and they've got these huge double garages. What's in there? Washing machines, bicycles, kids' toys, Guilty. rubbish, clutter. Guilty. Oh, and there's a lathe in the corner and a bike and you go, I've got no space, I've got no room to do anything. But at least you, there's no washing so, machines, it's yeah, just your... This is a small space, but... It's your space. I've got just enough, I've got my nice lathe, I've got the mill, my TIG welder, vice drilling machine. Ba basic stuff. And, and files, I just use files. Lots, lots of files. All different shapes and sizes of files, and that's all you need. And a decent vice. You've got to have a decent vice and a decent bench. And that's, you don't need any more than this. That's all the tools I've got. That need, is it. I mean, yeah, where's, like you said, spans. where's the red snap on toolkit? Every spanner tells a tale. It's like, like some of them, like this one here, has been modified. I've modified it to do Triumph 750 base bolts. I wanted to ask you. That one there, it's thin and ground down to get in places. I wanted to ask you. Sometimes there's things where I'll look at stuff I did in magazines years ago or books that I've read or you listen to music and it sets off a memory. Do you mm. get that? I do. You must have a memory, like I you do. say. And I've got things written down everywhere. Like H2, 3mm, 4 top left centre, 118,000, things like that. And just I write stuff down quickly. There's a, a note charity board. support thing there. And Crankshaft bearings, where they go on H1s and H2s, just to sort of where I've written stuff in the YL1 time in there, that the Yamaha. I like it. But all my spanners are different. They're, look, that, that one's a long one, ratchet one, because I needed a long one for a job to get in somewhere, so I went and bought a long one. I see the one I bought. Didn't need to That's it, yeah. No, no, no whole kit, no outfit kit for you. And I've got some gauges and stuff up here. Which is, you, know, you need that measuring equipment and stuff, and the cylinder lining. I've got my reboring machine down there, doing rebores. I do all my crankshaft work on the lathe. That's, I've got a converter for main, so it's actually 415 volt, three phase, which is nice. <laughs> and then various oils and things, and that, this is it. You could put all this in the back of a transit, basically. And, you could. And set it up anywhere. You don't, you don't need loads of tools. Up until about 10 years ago, I didn't have any machines. It was just hand tools and a little tiny model maker's lathe that I had. So you'd be literally cutting engines in half? By the... hand. The V12 and the V8, Kawasaki, and all my fives up to about the year 2001, were done by hand entirely. Cut, filed, scraped, and then welded. welded. All I by mean, hand. That must be kind of measure 15 times cut once. Yeah, well I got quite good at cutting in the end. I could just saw down the line, imagine. get it pretty close. I did it at the show at the Stafford in um, 98 or 99. I made five cylinder Kawasaki engine. I did all the sawing in front of everybody. And people were picking up pieces and they just fitted together without any filing. So, so, but then I bought myself a nice milling machine and out of a garden for 50 pounds, it was growed into the ground and rusted solid. An Elliot, 1950s Elliot, and I rebuilt that machine. I've had it ever since. But I've just recently, in the last 10 years, bought a Colchester Bantam, which is a nice machine. But I tend to make do with what I've got. I don't, so, you know, you've got what you need. You I, don't don't go need and, I don't need a shiny snap-on tool kit with the chrome-plated spanners and the red drawers with the ball bearing sliders. Yeah, that's does, a bit does, no, does nothing for me, I'm afraid. I've seen it in people's garages. They've got the carpet down and they've got all the tools. But they change their oil and maybe bolt an accessory onto their bike with it. They're not engineering. <clears throat> no, you don't need it. You need one or two really decent spanners you can trust. And you need a decent saw and some nice hammers and some planishing hammers and dollies. I do all my expansion chambers by hand. I don't roll them in rollers. I just bend them around my knee, tap them on pieces of wood. And that's, that's how I do it. Just how basics, I, it's getting all the basics right. Handmade. When I say I've handmade a bike, it's exactly what I've done. And this has done 1,100 miles now, I've not missed a beat. It's barely got an oil leak, it doesn't vibrate, and it cruises. Barely. Well, I've got a tiny oil leak. British. It's British. It's British. Ten piece bit size drip on it. So I'm going to the Isle of Man on this in a few weeks. I'm going to ride it up to the Isle of Man, 200 miles up the motorway. Super. Probably do a couple of hundred miles on the, on, the, on the island and ride it back. So that'd be a proper test. It'd be sort of 600 miles in four days. I've got my clock, so I won't be late. <laughs> I love that. It's proper, it's a wind-up yeah. one. So you can adjust the hands with the same knob. I made that, because that's actually a car one put into a motorcycle. Because you remember in the 90s when people would suddenly realise that they want a watch or a clock on a bike, yeah. so you'd buy the little stick-on ones, that's or some right, people would right. get a little bit of uh, double-sided tape and yeah. get a Timex. That's it. And now every bike's got, got a clock. A clock. And that, I love that. Oh, that is a period clock on, on the velo. That's, that's got one beautiful. Right it's got the same Smith wind up clock. Oh, excellent. And I've, got, I've, got, I've got one in stock up here, let's see. Just in case. That's how I buy them. Looks like that. I take them, let's take, take them apart. Look. That's all we Put inside. them in a proper clock. Take, 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 take the case in the 
we've got the old Timlet. Love it. Glycerin pastels. Yeah, like that. It's just cool. It's just cool stuff. All the old stuff, that's why you used to do ignition time in the like 1970s. Oh God. Just doing the points is, is there anything that the modern toolkit or the modern builder would have that you kind of envy? Or is it or is it's nothing that you can't do well, with all yeah, the bases? I don't, I don't really know, really. I've got a digital caliper. I've bought a modern digital, digital caliper. I barely use it. But really? It I just use the old burner calipers and stuff. So tell me, you, you, you were mentioning earlier about CX500. How did you get hold of that? Well, it's a bit of a, little bit of a story, really, because I, I had this all my British bikes and the CD175. I said to my dad, I want to get a new bike. I'm going to get a Honda. And that sounds quite just sort of benign. He, he was quite impressed. I'm just, just going to get a Honda. Going to get a Honda. I said, it's about 1500 £1,600. Pounds. I lied a little bit on that. But I said, I've got most of the money. Would you sign the HP for the difference? He goes, yeah, 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 that's great. I'll do that. So we arranged time off work and he came, he took me down in his car, down to Rise Motorcycles in Southampton, opened the door, went and spoke to the salesman. And my dad said, what bike? I said, that one. He goes, you're not having it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, that's a Honda CBX 1000. He said, you're not having it. He said, you can forget it. <laughs> the latest he said, super bike for Super 78. Yeah, he said, basically, I'm not going to sign the HP. He said, if you find the money, that's up to you. He said, but I'm not signing the HP. So that was that. He said, you can have one of those which was the CX500. I said, okay, as long as it's a black one. So I, I settled yeah, for the black one. The difference in power, I mean, in weight. I mean, the oh, CBX1000 was what, 100 horsepower? 100, 105 horsepower yeah, it was. and the CX would have been what? 50, 48. Yeah, so 50. double the power, probably, yeah. God knows how much in weight. But in hindsight, and in rest respect, he was correct, because you shouldn't jump from a low-powered 175 Honda straight up to a CBX1000, because that would be asking for trouble. Anyway, so I got the CX500 and he was right and it was great and I loved it. I had it for three years, 36,000 miles. And then what did you do with it though? That sold because I bought a Kawasaki GPZ750. Didn't you have a little incident on the CX? The CX, I hit a tree. But that was Within the first few First weeks. couple of weeks. Yeah, I was around, I was living in Hungerford. So you think if that would have been the CX? It would have been destroyed. I was going around a bend. It was, I left college at six at night and it was cold but not frosty. And I hadn't learned that by the time I got home, it actually got frosty. So I went into this bend at like 45, like I did every night, and just skidded across the grass. Luckily, I lived at Hungerford, and it was just a smooth grass, common field. And I just skidded and skidded and skidded and skidded, and then the bike hit a tree, and I went skidding on past, and then got up and looked at the bike, covered in mud. But it was, in those days, we got the hammer out, straightened the wheels out, straightened the forks out, straightened everything out, and we rode to work the next day. And it was great, I had it for three years. So that went, and then I bought a GPZ 750, like we all did for straight across the frame four, and then the GPZ 1100s. Went for all that, and then eventually I got a BFR 750. Oh, I had a CX 500 Turbo as well. I had the CX 500, then I had the GPZ 750, then I had a GPZ 1100, and I got bored with it. It was too brutal. I found that too brutal on the road, the GPZ 1100. It wasn't a Unitrack, it was a B2. So that went, and then in the Mercedes I can use a CX 500 Turbo with 3,000 miles on the clock, three years old. I thought, that sounds interesting. It rekindled your I liked my CX. Yeah. What a bike. Mm. I had it for seven years. It would do 130 mile an hour all day on the autobahns. And it was good on the fuel, and it was just so fast and so nice to ride. I absolutely just loved it. So yeah, that happened. Then the VFR came along. I got so what bored. What VFR? Because they're FK, bikes. What still a bike. bike! All you have yeah. to do, right? Buy a VFR. Petrol tires. Petrol tires. Brakes. Petrol tires. Brakes. That's but it. But it took them a while to get there, didn't it? Yeah, brilliant bike. The VFs. Got bored with it, and I just one day I said to, to my wife at the time, I said, do you know what? I'm going to flog this bike and get myself an old bike to do up. So I sold the VFR. Got, you fool. Got good money for it and bought a H1F 500, all in bits from a chap in Basingstoke. Got it home and I thought, do you know what? I can see how the engineers converted this from the A7 twin into the triple. I'm going to do it again and make it into a five. And I made my first five. And that was 1996. And that's where it all stemmed from, really. Being bored with the VFR 750. So what's been your biggest challenge on one or any of your special builds. Is there only one particular job that you don't look forward to? Is there oh, any particular job that has got sort of... It's difficult to say. Every bike's got its challenge. I mean, my RC374 was a nightmare, really. I mean, I used to leave sleep on that bike. There's so much that's happening and it's all so small and all so compact and so high revving. But then my Kawasaki V12 making the crankshaft fit in an engine that's already shrunk in width because Kawasaki were conscious of its width. So they shrunk it down. So they'd literally paired everything back. They made it very. The they'd made it a long stroke, six. A yeah. very small piston with a long stroke compared with the CBX to try and make it narrower, and everything was narrow, and the com rods were all narrow, and I had to try and squeeze in twice the amount of stuff. So I had to use aviation technology to get around that, and you have to 
one connecting which rod. Which obviously comes from what your background is. Yeah, hinged off another, so it's like a, so it's a width. But that, that was quite hard getting that sorted out. Then the Viper, managing the mass. You've got a motor, motorcycle that's safe at 200 miles an hour that weighs 600 kilos, hitting potholes and stresses and stuff. That was difficult. See, that's the thing, it's not just the engine. It's certainly not with the Viper, is it? No. The engine's kind of done. The engine was For done. For you, it's the chassis, it's, it's, and working out how you can handle that motor in that chassis. 500 horsepower and 500 pounds foot of torque. So you wrap the throttle open and you don't want the frame to bend or the chain to jump off. The swinging arm weighs 150 pounds on that Viper bike. It's made out of 10 millimeter thick honeycomb steel. So it's, I mean, I can barely pick it up because the amount of torque that- But it needs to be like that to handle the- Single sided, stress. yes. So, so I, I can't really say, one thing I don't, I never look forward to making the silences on two strokes, the expansion chain, it's all cutting, tin snips and welding and bashing. I don't mind doing a one-off, when you're making a five, you've got to make five of them. Yeah. It can get a bit tedious, but. So the 374 was a bit. The 374 was, it was just the engine, there was so much going on inside the engine and, and it's so high revving and so, everything is so tiny. I've got some valves I can show you that if it's just minuscule, you know. But and I also did it very it's quickly. It's like making a Swiss watch by the It was. Over there. Yeah, but I did it in eight months as well. From and scratch. that's the thing, it's sublime to ridiculous. You've got, you know, the flying milliard with a bit of an air, you know, five radial thousand. aerial engine, and then you've got the Viper V10, Ten. and then you've got these little, beautiful little Swiss watch sort of engines. The SS100s, the, the, um, the, the, the Moy Balasset. It's all, all the bikes are different. They're all totally different from each other. Do you actually have any favourite that you've built? Is there anything that really kind of makes you think that's, you know, what you'd be remembered for? Or, I mean, you, like you said, you've won how many, how many Salon Privé Awards? I've been going seven years and I've won five times. It's five out of seven years. I mean, yeah, the highest level competition, concourse event in the UK. I think it's third in the world. So is there any one of those winners even that you would, that sort of sticks? It's, it's, it's really strange, is it? It's almost the one I'm riding today is my favourite, if that makes sense. Mm. I mean, I can't, how can you but say? collectors say the same. Mm. Our Andy Bolas, who's, who's got 50 or 60 bikes, he loves them all. You can't, I mean, I've got my RC374 or, or the Velocet V twin. And then the daft thing is you'll get on a 1992 Pan-European and it'll be wonderful. That, that day, it's doing its job. Yeah. I, always, I always consider it as going to work when I ride the Honda Pan. I, mean, I never ride it for pleasure. It's mm. always, I've got to go to somewhere, I've got to be here, I've got to do that, I've got to pick this up, go to that show, I'll take the Honda Pan. Has there ever been a one that got away? And by that I mean, has there been a project that either you've had to give up midway through? You no, haven't. You've never, never had to give up. Never ever. You've always got. Through. I always see the finished bike before I start. I see it running. I okay, always get. I always get to that point. I'll turn that on its head. Is there anything that you've not done that you want to do, but you think you might not be able to do it? No. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I'll do it. I'll. I'll make everything work. I don't have that mindset. With that in mind then, will we ever see a milliard electric bike? Possibly. I wouldn't say no. Because can you imagine a classic, but with a modern... Mm. I made a mountain bike for my son. I knew nothing about mountain bikes. Fastest in the world, tested by Dirt Magazine. Because it ended up winning some championships or something, didn't it? Yeah, it, was the, it beat Honda. Honda. An official test, we beat Honda with their million pound production mountain bike. They made six of them. And my bike in a shed. And also my bike was being ridden by a journalist, not a athlete. And we beat them. That's just unbelievable. And my and son where does that come from? Is that just sort of sound engineering principles? Yeah, it's just or? thinking things through. He, he, he said to me, make me a mountain bike. No, he didn't say that. He said, I want to do a mountain bike race. I said, what, what, what's, what is it downhill? Is it like a push bike then? He said, well, no. So you just... wanted to know what the actual yeah. parameters were that this said, machine well, was said, being used? I said, go away. Make me a list of what you want in the bike. So he wrote me this list of all the stuff he needed. And I said, yeah, we can do that. And we can improve on it as well. Let's get rid of the derailleurs. Let's put the chain inside the frame so it can't get knocked off and damaged. Let's have it with suspension. It's common sense, really. Surely yeah, you think about it. I said, well, I took him to a race and I was spending £100 every time we raced on a new derailleur kit and chain. Because he'd come down the hill, he'd knock it on a rock, that would be gone. So this isn't happening. We're going to put the chain inside the frame. No one ever walks past that. No, of course. Everyone stops. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like something out of War of the Worlds or some sort of yeah, bike that like H.G. Wells would have ridden around on. You know, it's just mm. utterly crazy. But this was my dad's bike, so... I actually bought this in 1979 at an auto jumble, Ascot auto jumble for 70 quid or something. And then I swapped it with my dad because he had one that worked, a British bike that worked, before I got my CX500. And in the interim gap between my 175 and my CX, I had an AGS 350 for a few months. I mean, that must be, you know, it's got to be an emotional thing then. It is. That bike, it's why you did it and what, what it means to you. I had it for 40 years, basically. 
And my dad used to ride it around and he never used it. And when he was 60, I got it back off him and restored it for him as an original Valisette. And then he passed away four years ago, so I got it back. And I was riding it around and it nipped up. This oil pump was bad and it just nipped up. So I just chucked it in the shed and then one day I thought, do you know what? I'm going to make that into it. I was at Stafford, I sat at the Stafford with me RC. And some chap said, come and look at my Valisette I've restored, because he knew I had this Mac. I said, that's a really lovely Mac, it's really, really nice. And I, and I just thought, I've got to make mine into a V-twin. And I went straight across to the matey boy that was selling Valisat parts by the door and bought all the top end, the cylinder head, all this lot here, and a piston and crankshaft. I was all excited about it. By the time I got home, I'd worked out how I was going to do it. We were talking about inspiration, and that was it. That was it. I have to have an inspiration. It. And it took, this took me eight weeks to make from scratch. Everything. The whole ride. Finished. And how does it ride? Perfect. I've done 1,100 miles on it. My longest journey in one day, 220 miles in one day. Talk me through the Fly Milliard, because... That is what? Two cylinders from a Pratt & Whitney. A Pratt & Whitney, what, an R2800? Yeah, you can blame Steve Parrish for it. Now, an R2800 was a turbocharged, supercharged engine that served... It was, I think, one of the Americans' no, most... R1830, R1830. Oh, the R1830, because yes. I know that the, no. the 2800 was the big one that they it's used in the fitted, fighters and bombers. Fitted to a DC3. Oh, so it's a DC3 motor. Yes, so it's nine-cylinder supercharged. So at a nine cylinder supercharged DC three engine would be pumping out what, eight hundred horsepower? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. Fifty seven hundred. But I'm running this not supercharged obviously. Mm. But this bike this bike came about because I was at Salon Prive with the SS one hundred in two thousand and twelve and I'd won something with it, best show best in show or something. And Steve Parrish was the judge. Mm. Parrish does get he said, This is wonderful, Mr. Millier, great. We are we gonna see you next year with a new bike? And I just literally, that second said, I'll make the biggest V-twin and come back next year, because this was the smallest V-twin, 99cc. It's actually the smallest running V-twin in the world, I do believe. Guinness Book of Records wouldn't allow it as a class, because it's too, such a small class. But I've done some research, there's no other 99cc V-twins that are running on the road, and also there's four of them as well, so it's sort of li limited production run. So I just glibly said, I'll make the biggest. So I got straight home on eBay, typed into the internet. Stavros, it does do that to people. Yeah. I typed into eBay, big cylinders, and they come straight up. It said, big cylinders, unknown origin. And it was the British, it was the Vintage Motorcycle Club was selling them, James Hewing. So, yeah. I, so I put a bid on them and won them. Went straight up to Allen House in Birmingham and picked them up. And because it was me, and I knew James, and he said, oh, I've got some other bits that come with it. Cylinders, valves, springs, rockers. So they were unknown, so you, you, you found out. He, he, he didn't know what they were. a deceased club member yeah. that left them to the club. Were, so obviously that person may have had the idea of trying to build some did, huge V twin out of a did, DC three Dakota engine. I, I got some little exchange of mark clippings from 1964 saying engine from up and war, war surplus and little tiny sketches of a Morgan. He wanted to make a Morgan engine. Ah, oh, that makes Morgan. sense. Yeah, and he'd done some outline sketches to make a uh, five liter V twin. So I've really just done what he wanted to do. That's wonderful. Though. That's, that's such a story. And that came back to sound pretty well and got best in class the following year with Steve Parrish. And Cubic capacity? 5,000, just under. I think it's 4,850 or something like that. It's just under 5 litre. 5 litre V twin. Which is amazing. It does 60 mile an hour at 850 RPM. Which is lovely. You, you can cruise up the motor on it at 17. You're barely doing 1,000 revs. And I get 40 miles to the gallon at 70. But around town, if I use it around town, you're scratching 6, 7 to the gallon. Um, and how interesting is it to ride? It's great. I love it. It's got a hand shift. You've got advanced ignition with the big levers on the side. You've got a, um, the mixture control. You have to adjust the mixture while you're riding it. So as you open the throttle, you have to lean the mixture up a little Which bit. Which is obviously what the pilots Which were the pilots doing. Do. Yeah, yeah well, as you rev the engine up, you lean the mixture because it yeah. sucks harder and all this sort of stuff. They, I made the carburetor from scratch. They're just made out of solid metal. So you couldn't buy a carburetor for it. And the aeroplane, you had this humongous great carburetor to feed all nine cylinders through a supercharger. So I made my own carburetors and I just guessed. Main jets, three mil, yeah, pilot jets, 1.5. Mm. Needles, just turned a taper. And it just worked. I started it up and it just worked. The thing is, I know people kind of poo-poo all the old stuff, but it is amazing, even when you look back at aero engines from like the First World War, the rotaries that would be That's spinning. Amazing. Or that some would shut off certain cylinders yeah. as a throttle. Control it would. It would. on the very first radial engine where the engine went round, yeah, which would be spinning. They were set full throttle, there's no, no throttle, yeah. and it's to kill the ignition, yeah. And the, and the sparks would like a tremble around the outside, and they come into land again, boom, 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 because they're just killing the ignition to come into land. And then you take the ignition on to go full throttle, 
So they were pretty grim to write. And imagine the torque reaction on the engine. Which is why the Sockless Camel, which had a rotary yeah. engine, would, I think it was turn right really quick. Yeah, but not left. But not left. Yeah. And of course, when you turn right, it would snap roll and... That's it. Ew. That's, that, that's, it's such a laugh to use. And it's, I've done nearly 10,000 miles on that now. No mechanical problems. Just looking at the Viper, you can see it does almost look like, I mean, I don't mean to say this in a bad way, it looks like a, a child's toy because it's just so well, big and just I, so, I, like I say, it, it's been scaled up, isn't it? The, the exhaust it. even is, is uh, the, it's in proportion. It's, it's three inch bore. Yeah, the, 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 the exhaust is in proportion with the rest of the bike. The grab handle is in proportion with the tail unit, which, like you say, it's almost like a bike times 1.5 the normal size. Yeah. This is what I did. Everything's scaled up. The forks are 75 millimeters diameter. Goodness. These are all made out of solid on a lathe. See, this is 10 millimeter thick uh, aircraft quality aluminium. It's, uh, on, on, this bike is indestructible. That's like a Porsche cut race car. It has to be. Yes. Yeah. Ventilated disc look. 355 yeah. millimeters with twin six pot calipers, carbon fiber heat shields, titanium pistons. Because like you say, the, the amount of power and weight this is dealing with, it needs yeah. to be kind of aeronautical kind of kit. One finger at 200 races I've done this. One finger at 200 knocks 50 mile an hour off in a couple of seconds. What's the master cylinder from? On the pan European. A pan European master cylinder? Yeah. Because yeah. I wanted to know whether check, that was check, some check special out, kit. Check out my Lynx clutch, look. Oh my goodness. So you can, the clutch, you have to use your hand and your foot because it's got a 1,100 pound spring in the clutch. So to get it, I've got a vacuum servo and twin hydraulics. It's got three hydraulic circuits to operate the clutch because I wanted to keep the proper original clutch. And how many miles have you done now on the Viper V10? I'll go and get my ignition key and show you. So 8,902? Yeah, miles. In 10 years, though. Yeah. 8,902? Yeah, so all the heat goes out the back of the bike rather than in the manifold. Because I mean, also your legs. Yeah, I've got heat shields, and this has got um, special stuff behind it, like using the National Space Shuttle tiles. It doesn't burn your legs. Now, obviously, your Viper engined machine has done 200 mile an hour. At I've, and my personal best is 200.8. That's what I was going to ask you. That's my fastest I've been. 207.1. Bruce Dunn, obviously, the little flying whippet that yeah. the weekly newspaper use is yeah. a professional speed tester so i wanted to know what the fastest you've been I, I, on the day he did 207 i did 200.8 <coughs> uh, and the weirdest it's thing it's amazing there's there is a, a method because i used to as big as i am and stupid as i am i used to be road test editor for bike magazine so i'd go up and down that runway quite a lot yeah and we'd take this little whip it kind of speed tester and it's amazing how much speed you get by folding in mirrors by moving around on the bike and he didn't we didn't need that the, the Bruce was Bruce was when we looked at the telemetry that. afterwards he was using half throttle really and but I just I did warn him because I rode it first I did like 190 on it first before I let Bruce have a go I wanted to test it out for my own safe to make sure I was happy with it I said just be careful if it runs away with you and you can't shut the throttle off he goes what do you mean and I said well it pulls so hard You're off the you back can't back. physically roll your hand back he goes no, I've never had that before. He said, I can't. He said, no, he said, I'm a professional tester. I'd leave, leave it to me. He went out on a run and came back. He goes, you can't throttle off. He goes, you can't shut off. And he said, he actually said to me, it's the hardest pulling bike he's ever ridden in his 30 years of testing motorcycles. And when we looked at the telemetry. He's a decent 250cc two two-stroke racer as well. Precisely. He's seriously fast on Very RGs good. and that. But we looked at the telemetry from zero to 207.101 when he shut off. It was a straight line. And they overlaid it over all... Just a all massive line of what one speed or torque? Acceleration, but a straight Sorry. line. Every single bike or vehicle goes into the curb about 170. So as the, the wind resistance goes up at a cube root of it's, it's just exponential acceleration. So as you're going up in speed, the, the wind pressure is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And no matter what bike you ride, you go in the, they say going in the curve. The Suzuki Hayabusa Turbo will go in the curve about 175. This one hadn't reached the curve yet at 207. You need more than Brunting Thorpe's what? Two miles, is it? But it, it? The two miles is fine, but it's having the guts to hold on to, to the pull. So you almost need to be strapped into it. Yeah. It's a strange feeling. I, I talk to people that ride really powerful, modern tuned up bikes, but that the power comes, it's a different power. Mm. That makes 500 bhp all day long on a dyno. You can put it on a dyno and just sit it at 500 bhp and leave it there all day and it just make it reliably. Whereas people tune their bikes up to make 500 that's bhp. That's what it's built for, isn't it? That's yes, the thing. That's it's what a truck that engine. Built for. It's a truck engine, basically. 
it's very split second. They, they, it'll go 200 bhp. Because it needs to be pulling a lot of weight. They got to back off immediately as you melt the pistons. I rode it to Guernsey for a couple of days for a bike night a few weeks ago. And it was on the ferry down to Brown Guernsey, come back. Crazy. If the ferry engine breaks, I suppose they can always... I was worried where I parked it in the ferry. In case it... Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. What's important to you, one of the most important facets of any special that you build, it needs to look factory almost. That, that's my it? trademark. Yeah, I have, I have to make it People almost... Do, it's a look, it's a, like a double take bike. If I get a it's double take, like a... if I get a double take, I've hit my goal. It's all the bike, that Vela set, I take it to shows I've done recently, people walk straight past it. But it, but the Viper shows that you don't do subtle also. Yeah, but, the, but then the Viper, it, I try, I needed it to look like a motorbike. I've seen so many car engine bikes, there's so many of them well, around. The Boss Hogs are awful. Boss Hogs is, it's, Boss it's Hosses, acres yeah. of glass fibre covering over not brilliant engineering in my opinion. But And there's various other bikes I've seen where people have put car engines in. There's a BMW V12 I think, there's a, a Lamborghini V12 bike. They're great jobs, absolutely brilliant, but not my style. The Viper, I had to make it look like a motorcycle, so I scaled everything up. I didn't just use standard motorbike wheels. They're actually car wheels. The forks I made from scratch, I scaled everything up by about 40%. So it just looks like a very big bike. So when you look, if you take a picture of it on its own, at a right angle, it just looks like a normal motorcycle. Whereas other bikes I've seen, the wheels are like scooter wheels, because they've got 17-inch motorcycle wheels, and the bike's really big. So the wheels look, in perspective, they look smaller. So how on earth then do you kind of make, uh, you, you know, a, a, a V12, Z1300, Z26 uh, look like it came out of the factory? Everything was slightly stretched, a little bit, but the tank was slightly longer. The, the engine, when I cut the engines up, I can, see, I can see where to cut to make it look like it was a factory. And I'll actually weld in webs and I'll weld bits back on that aren't necessary, but make it look like it's been cast. And that's the trick. And I use fillers sometimes in the corners to build things up to make it look like a casting. Because to me, that's the, the priority, is it's got to look like it's come out of the Kawasaki factory, at least as a prototype, if not a production vehicle. Uh, and, and do you think is that, that that's why you get the awards? Because that, there's that attention to detail, rather than Maybe. just doing it, and like you say, with those sort of Chevy engine bikes, it's just building it and making it work. Making it work. About. But it's making it work and making it look right. But do they work? I mean, Dodge brought out their Tomahawk and they claimed 400 miles an hour. That's, there's no way. There's no way. I've never seen one anywhere online go faster than 20 or 30. And I do believe they crashed one at Goodwood. It wouldn't go around the corner. It crashed at 45. But my, I, so that's why I made the Viper B10. Because my youngest son said to me, I need to make one that works. Um, on eBay, oh my God, there's a Viper engine. Oh dear, do we have to buy it, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I bought it. Now I've got no money for three years because it costs too much. <laughs> and then I made the Viper bike. So final question then. Does your kind of strange pastime of building these motorcycles get in the way of normal life? Because I know you said to me back at the last CMM show that you'll have these eureka moments at one, two, three in the morning. And rather than like the most of us maybe writing down what we need to do and then going back to sleep, you're straight out into the oh, Yeah, I had to do that once with the RC. I was in the middle of the night, I woke I was really st stressing over the crankshaft because I, I had no room. I basically, I was scratching for millimetres here, there and everywhere to get all the parts to fit inside the, the FZ crankcases. And I suddenly woke up and thought, if I machine down the thrust shims by half a mil from 2.5 down to 2, times 6, so there's one each size, that's times 12, I've gained like half an inch. So I rushed downstairs, put a washer up in my lathe and actually skimmed it down and measured it all up and put what put one assembly together in like half an hour and yeah sure enough i'd saved myself 10 millimeters per set of flywheel webs and that so then, that was a two, then i got back to bed and slept completely through then and i was a fine woke up the next morning and then re replicated it on all the other shims and solved the problem and that's the shims i had the machine down in there yeah that's the thing that you woke up at three in the morning yeah because this width here was just too wide yeah and if I machined this down, there wasn't enough engagement for the bottom of the crank. So is it 0.5 of a mil yeah, on each half, one? Took half mil off each one. Times 12? That's a millimetre, times six. Six, times six. six a quarter of an inch. It's a It's beautiful. See the piston's tiny. It's a work of art, isn't it? Kawasaki KX80 connection rod, don't reinvent the wheel. No. Yamaha YZ, F, the 250, um, FZR 250RR piston. And these are special bearings I bought, and I made the crest myself. Well, Alan, thanks for getting some of your uh, bikes out for us. Uh, are these the ones that are actually going to be at the Kawanash show? Yeah. It's these, these three, four here, plus the Flying Milliard SS100 and the Valisat. Which obviously we saw we see inside, earlier. Yeah. So tell me about this amazing creation, because this is... I know you like to do a sort of double-take bike, 
but this does seem quite different, doesn't it, because of the motor. Tell us a bit about it. Well, it's a H1 Kawasaki 1970, so it's the um, H1A body. It's got H2 front end, which has been shortened to make it the right length. But the thing is, the engine is a four-cylinder Kawasaki-based bottom end with Yamaha RD250LC top ends and Suzuki GT550 connecting rods. I wanted the 54-54 stroke to make it a proper 500, so I couldn't use the Kawasaki crankshaft because that's got a longer stroke. Mm. So I used Yamaha RD250 crankshaft webs. I had to machine the crankcases out to, to fit the Yamaha bearings and seals. But then the deck height was incorrect. The pistons didn't come right to the top of the cylinders. But I found out by chance that the GT550 comrods fit the Yamaha flywheels and are two millimeters longer. Because I happen to have one laying around in the How garage. How did you find out that by chance? I've Just got, by suddenly getting your box of Conrods out? Precisely, I've got a box of Conrods. Only which you I can have a box you. of Conrods. I've got a box of Conrods, worn out. I can always keep the worn ones because you can use them as gauges to check. I've, always, I've made a lot of four cylinder Kawasaki two strokes, which is relatively straightforward. Just join it up, put individual cylinders on. But the Yamaha stud spacing didn't match the Kawasaki stud spacing, so I had to block up all the holes and re tap them, put new stud spacings in. Then the, the Yamaha cylinder heads didn't fit the Yamaha barrels because I've made the barrels slightly further apart to match the Kawasaki crank width. Yeah. So I had to rank, widen the heads, which I've done. But I've got it all back in okay, and it's absolutely ballistic. The power comes yeah, what in... what is it like to ride? It's 6,000 to 10,000 of massive, strong power. Yeah, that's not a power band, is it? That's it's a power. It just comes in at six, and it just goes straight to 10, whereas the ordinary Kawasaki piston port engines stop at about eight. This has got another 2,000 revs on top. So with standard Kawasaki 500 gearing, the top end's gone way up. Well, I've not tried it for proper top end, but it, it, on a private road I've got it, it'll pull 100 in third oh without God. any trouble at all. So if we move on then? This is my little Kawasaki S2A350, which was normally a three-cylinder, mm -hmm. but I used the 250 barrels and converted it into a four-cylinder, so it brings it out a 333. But then by having one and a half millimetre oversized pistons, it's near a 350. And this thing flies. John Nutting tested it for the magazine last year and, and he actually said it's, it feels nicer to ride than the original triple, which is to me the ultimate accolade. He did say to me that it's amazing and I didn't build it. No, it's smoother, it revs nicer, it starts easy, works. And it's, it's a lovely bike to ride, it's very relaxing to ride because it's very and it light. it seems like you've been riding it, you know, there's a little bit I, of a weep from I do, I, I do, yeah, no, you can't help that. Well, yeah, but you'd have that with any, yeah, any classic bike. Tires are worn on the edges and stuff. I, I use this for commuting quite often to work, the 40 mile each way trips on this, it's 80 miles a day. In fact, I take all my bikes once a week when it's nice. So, it. so every day I ride a different bike. The ST 1100 is my stable workhorse for weathers. But, but this, this is so, but it's such a small bike as well. I quite like small bikes. Because you can ride a small bike hard and enjoy it, whereas a big bike, you've got to ride it carefully. Yeah, it rides you sometimes if, yeah. you, if you get it all wrong. Yeah. So this, this one, I think, uh, is one of my favourites, just because of the way it looks. Because sometimes with the other engines, they do seem to dominate the look of the bike, whereas this actually kind of looks as if it's a... Well, this one... I know they all look like they could have come out of the factory, but this one almost looks as if it's what they probably should have done. This is like a steam hammer. It's two thirds of a H2. So it's a two hour cylinder of a H2 with the middle one cut out. It was basically leftover parts from making, when I made a 1004. But to make, to, to make 1004, I have to have two H2 triple engines. So the bits that are left over from doing the cutting process. Because you don't throw anything away, no, obviously. Welded that back together and made the 500 twin. And it is, it's got KH500 gearbox and clutch, and it's got KH500 primary drive. So it's got the correct drive ratio for a 500. But it's like a steam hammer, it's instant massive torque and power it just it explodes into life basically and it, it'll it'll cruise at ridiculous speeds 80 mile an hour absolutely effortlessly all day long the exhaust because it's the 500 engine the exhausts are long yeah because they're the same exhaust that i make for my 1004 but, on, but that's a bigger bike the thing is it still it seems to me like you've almost got a bike for every mood yeah you have you know because you, have. you know there, there are some like you say that you can almost want to be scared by and yeah. be ridden by, you know, like maybe the Viper, but yeah. you've, you've this also is, got stuff that's sweet handling and it's just a... It's very much like a dirt bike. It's got dirt bike type characteristics. Now, I mean, with, with machines like this, you really need to get the look right. And obviously the paint's very important. Who do you get to do the paint? Because that's just, my, it is again, like it's come out of... My friend, Neil Howarth, he's been painting all my bikes for 20 years. He's, he's a one man band in a shed. 
but his quality well, where it reminds me of you yeah in, impeccable quality yeah. in fact he has he never has to advertise once in all the years he's been painting and not I bet once he's got a huge backlog and he's got two years ahead of work oh, on him me. he paints cars like lagondas and bentleys and all old vintage stuff that in fact one of his cars won at pebble beach beat jay leno into second place wow so he put what it is with neil he puts it on properly everyone can make a nice finish but if you get a screwdriver and try and scratch that you can't is this where as well is the finish better than original but much say? better because much they better. wouldn't used to paint the ins under the tank no they? and they have, they have an orange peel finish on yeah. and stuff this is all lac um, lacquered and machine polished back to a glass glass finish i get the stickers um in fact rick brett supplies the stickers triple triple yeah. triple club and, and again really really proper, good it's not painted on there no 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 it's all properly proper, done properly done yeah and the seat covers and you can get you can get all these parts now you can get replica grab rails replica these are the original indicators on this bike wow in fact all the chrome on this bike is original so like, again, you, you, like you say, you, you almost have bits left over that you decide to make another bike for. Yeah, I don't like to over-restore things. But this, this no, hasn't but you been, see it's been used. If it doesn't need to not, be re no. don't bother. No. I mean, the mud guards, that's the original Kawasaki chrome. Yeah. That's how it came, yeah. satin brushed. It wasn't miss, like gloss finish. On some bikes like this one, we had to have some stuff re-chromed because it was rusty. Now this bike, yes, let's, let's talk about this because this, this was a birthday present, I believe. It was for my son so, Sam, yeah. So, and it, Sam's I, here and he's going to fire it up for us and yeah. tell us. The, the deal was, he paid for the bit, so I built it for him. That doesn't so. sound like much of a birthday present to me, but... Well, it was because he got a good bike for a good price. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> yeah. well we, we might ask him. We dug it out of a field, the bike, I think, for oh, about well, £400, so, I think it was. Oh, well, that's not Is too it? bad. £400? Let's get Sam in. Come, yeah, over, come Sam. on, Sam. Sam, I mean, tell us about this bike. Uh, it was a birthday present yep. of sorts. About two or three years ago now. I love riding it, but I, I can't really compare it to a standard one because I've never ridden a standard, standard Kawasaki two straight other than the 750s. Uh, but my friend does have a standard one which I can leave behind quite easily. I can imagine. So the, the yeah. original bike came from where? It's from Texas. So it's an import. And we picked it up, it was basically in a field when we collected it uh, in a bit of a sorry state. And then within, within like an hour, it was stripped here. And then that's when it all began, really. We we're going to restore it as an original bike initially. But yeah, like not do it up <coughs> so much, but um, it was pretty far gone. Well, it, it definitely looks that little bit, as well as obviously still looking factory, there are some giveaways. I mean, tell us a bit about, about the engine and the motor. What's happened in there? Well, there's obviously a couple extra cylinders, <laughs> thanks to Dad. Two more on the uh, left. Yeah. Um, so Dad had a donor engine. It did feel kind of odd hacksawing my new... Bike. Your new old bike, yeah. yeah. Valuable. Did he make you do out. any of the work? Because he is yeah, quite. He's, yeah. He's like cut there, cut, and I was like, this feels weird. So I just bought this. Yeah. Bike. Uh, and now I'm cutting it in half. Rare seventies classic. Yeah. So Milliard and Son. This one is yeah. rather than just Milliard. Yeah. 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 And um, there's a lot of original parts in it. It's just like a lot of the chrome's original. Uh, mm. Indicates the grab rail, the rims. Uh, the only chrome stuff that needed to be either modified or was really bad to keep the to keep the cost down. Talking about costs, he made you buy the bits yourself. Yeah, so so he, he made you work I... on it and he bought, <laughs> made you buy the parts for it, but he claims it's a birthday present. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I wonder I... if you're working out if you've been had there, but, <laughs> but I suppose at least you get to ride this amazing bike. And, and you yeah. said that it can blow a, a normal 400 into the weeds. I mean, yeah. I don't, yeah, and I don't think anyone can buy a bike like this. Uh, so it's, it's a one off. Quite special. But um, yes, yeah, I love riding it. It, turn, it makes you into a bit of a hooligan. Uh, just because of its nature, I suppose. But the thing is, you look at it, and, and again, people would think, oh, look at that, it's a lovely classic bike from the 70s. Yeah. And then they'll hear it. Now, I believe we're going to be able to hear it. And again, this is going to be at the show, isn't it? Yeah, this will be at the show. So, 26th Carol Nash, uh, yeah. classic motorcycle mechanic show at Stafford, uh, October, what is it, 19th, 20th? I think it is. Yeah. And uh, also, it's not all about polished bikes, it's about bikes that are ridden. That's the thing. I mean, like I said, some of your bikes I've looked at, and you can see that the forks have gone up and down. You can see yeah. that they've actually been used, and there's a bit, not much patina. I mean, the way I check is, is wheels. If wheels are clean, it's someone who's pretty meticulous. But yeah. Yeah. obviously, I'm not sure if at the show these are going to be moved out to be heard uh, in our sort of classic racer paddock. Maybe, I don't know. But if we could just have a little listen, if you could so yeah. start it up, start Sam. Up. Yeah. Um, because we did hear it actually come in and turn up uh, about a couple of hours ago, and there was no mistaking that uh, Sam Milliard had arrived. It is cold now.
and it, set, it settles down to a really lovely burble like they all do. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Now you've got very good neighbours. They are, as long as you don't take the mic, they're okay. Exactly. Well, yeah. I hope we didn't. But anyway, so, I mean, thank you very much for showing us around these. And obviously, these are the bikes that are going to be at the show yep, plus in the October. Other three. And of course, the yeah. other three that we've seen. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for showing us around, Alan, Sam. So yeah. I shall see you at the show. Yeah. See you there as well. Thank you very much. Okay.